So this is an image of Winston Churchill, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and Joseph Stalin, the big three um, of World War II. Uh, eventually, FDR actually dies, and Truman replaces um, FDR at these conferences. Um, they hold conferences talking about the post-war resolution when it becomes clear that Germany is going to lose. Um, Stalin is pretty determined after the tide of the war turns to get to Berlin first. Uh, he wants to get to Berlin first, and you can see in that, like, the competition among these allies um, already existing. Um, so we'll talk about the Cold War. I'll give you a snapshot of what the Cold War encompassed uh, in the next slide, which are actually notes from an MIT class, a class at M MIT. And then uh, we'll talk about the origins of the Cold War. Um, so what exactly is the Cold War? I wanted to give you a snapshot, a snapshot of what the Cold War is before we actually get into talking about it. This is actually a, um, these are notes from a lecture at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, um, or MIT. Um, so the Cold War lasts between 1947 to 1989, and basically the Soviet Union and the United States um, are competing with one another, and uh, the world has a feeling that there's going to be a major outbreak of war, or there possibly could be a major outbreak of war between the United States and the Soviet Union. Um, it's called the Cold War because the U.S. and the Soviet Union never actually def directly fight one another. Um, one of the things I try to emphasize in class, though, is that the Cold War is really not cold, but actually very hot uh, for people, especially in the Third World. So you can see wars in the Cold War, Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Cambodia, Nicaragua, Angola, El Salvador. <laughs> Um, Soviet interventions, uh, you can see a list of U.S.-sponsored coups in Iran. Um, we'll talk more about that one. Guatemala, Chile, Congo, Brazil, Greece, and then you can see crises. Uh, Berlin, and then uh, the famous one, the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, etc. So now we're going to talk about the causes of the Cold War. So what actually led up to uh, the start of the Cold War? Um, so there's a Warsaw Uprising in 1944 in Poland, where Stalin basically convinced Poland non-communists to rebel against Hitler and then watch passively as uh, Nazi Germany slaughtered them. Um, Americans wondered what else Stalin would do. Stalin also made a vague promise at Yalta in February 1945 to allow democracy in Poland. Then he imposed communist dictatorship instead. In 1946, Stalin wouldn't leave northern Iran until pressured. These are just some of the instances that led up to um, the start of the Cold War. The Berlin Crisis, which is basically often viewed as one of the first major events of the Cold War, uh, begins in 1948. Uh, so the Berlin blockade was an attempt in 1948 by the Soviet Union to limit the ability of the United States, Great Britain, and France to travel to their sectors of Berlin, which lay within Russian-occupied East Germany. Um, so after World War II, Germany is divided among the victorious powers into zones of influence. In June 1948, the simmering tensions between the Soviet Union and its former allies in World War II exploded into a full-blown crisis in the city of Berlin. Alarmed by the news that a uh, new U.S. policy of giving economic aid to Germany and other struggling European nations, as well as efforts by the Amer Western allies to introduce a single currency to the zones they occupied in Germany and Berlin, the Soviets blocked all rail, road, and canal access to the western zones of Berlin. Um, so because Berlin itself was divided among the four um, powers again, um, although it was, as you can see, in um, the Russian sector or the Soviet sector of the division of Berlin, the capital itself was divided into four. Um, so the Soviets denied access to uh, Western uh, countries' um, sector of Berlin, and so the Berlin airlift be uh, began, um, where the U.S. basically um, flew planes into their sectors and uh, provided much needed economic assistance. So what actually caused initial events like this? Um, so there's a lot of debate, but one of them is simple, uh, communist totalitarian expansion. Um, so this idea, or as a cause, the Soviets were the aggressor, uh, the democratic West, the defender, Soviet aggression sprang from the aggressiveness of communist political systems, 
communists are aggressive because they are um, because of their ideology preaches um, that communism will one day rule the world. Um, we saw that especially in George Keenan's piece, uh, the, co uh, the Sources of Soviet uh, Conduct. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so that's one school of thought. So Soviet entrance into Eastern Europe, it threatened U.S. security, causing the Cold War. So pictured is Nikita Khrushchev and John Kennedy, but uh, just to remember, Soviet expansion in Eastern Europe took place under uh, Joseph Stalin. Um, another cause of the Cold War that's kind of almost like a corollary to this would be that U.S. softness early in the Cold War made things worse. The U.S. led the Soviets forward by appeasement. Instead, the U.S. Um, should have given Stalin an ultimatum in 1946, get out of Eastern Europe or we'll throw you out. Um, so that's, that's often cited by a lot of people as a potential cause of the Cold War. One of my favorite is just, um, you know, it's just, this is how the system works. There's a security dilemma. Um, the world's two strongest states rarely get along because each is the main threat to the other. They will always compete for security. Uh, the Cold War was an inevitable result of the rise of the U.S. and the Soviet Union uh, to world power. Um, so because they're the two biggest, baddest um, countries in the system, there's naturally going to be suspicion and insecurity um, against one another. Um, so we talked about the security dilemma, and so maybe you as an individual country are not um, necessarily um, looking to pursue expansion. You're just looking to secure yourself. But things that you do to uh, secure yourself, like uh, building maybe more weapons because you're afraid of the environment, you're afraid of the international system, you're afraid of outsiders, um, may come across as threatening to another country. And that country might decide to build weapons. And so you can see that logic and how that eventually spirals into the security dilemma. Uh, so that's also a potential cause of the Cold War. These are some major events in the Cold War. So I'll create this timeline for you and then talk over it. So in 1945, the UN is founded. We discussed the United Nations in the next video and how it kind of becomes basically irrelevant during the Cold War uh, because the Soviet Union and the United States can't agree and they're the most powerful members of the United Nations. 1946, Cannon, uh, George Cannon, he's a member, or he's a uh, diplomat, an American diplomat. He uh, comes up with the idea of containing the Soviet Union. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about this and explain how um, what he says in his famous pe or his famous long telegram and the sources of Soviet conduct, which is an article he wrote for Foreign Affairs, also gets at one of the causes of the Cold War, potential causes of the Cold War. Uh, also in 46, uh, Winston Churchill says his Iron Curtain speech. Um, the Iron Curtain speech um, by Winston Churchill. Churchill says that an Iron Curtain is descending over Eastern Europe. Um, so he is kind of uh, raising the alarm about the Cold War. Um, of course, NATO was founded. Um, NATO is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It's a system of alliances that promises um, to defend if one is attacked to um, all come in and collectively defend against um, the aggressor. Um, and then, of course, the Korean War begins in 1950 to 1953. Uh, Korea is occupied after... Uh, World War II and divided eventually into two zones, into North and South Korea, Communist North and capitalist or Democratic Capitalist South. Um, the North invades under Kim Il-sung. Uh, the United States responds with UN forces. Um, they uh, push them back and then eventually the Chinese actually enter into the fray in the war and then every it, all, everyone gets pushed back to the 38th parallel. And the Korean War technically hasn't ended, uh, but it's still going on. thing I wanted to mention before I get into uh, George Kennan. Um, so here is a map in the blue is NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, uh, or L'OTAN in uh, French. I don't know why I did that, but I did. Um, and then uh, in the red, you can see the Warsaw Pact. So these are uh, two organizations with basically the same function. An attack on one is viewed as an attack on all, um, etc. Last thing, when we're talking about the Soviet Union or the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, USSR, um, we're talking about countries more than Russia. You can see uh, Kazakhstan in there, Uzbekistan, 
uh, Ukraine, Belarus, they were all part of the same entity. Um, after the Soviet Union breaks up, then all these um, different countries actually leave. Um, so George Kennan publishes the Long Telegram, which is a telegram that he writes uh, to try to get people to, our, our diplomats in Washington, our policymakers in Washington, to understand that the Soviet Union really is never going to uh, become friends with the United States. And um, he eventually publishes his uh, elements of the Long Telegram in a uh, article that he writes under Mr. X um, in Foreign Affairs, which is a magazine. He publishes it for the general public called the Sources of Soviet Misconduct. Or conduct, and so basically, his claim is his central claim is that the Soviet Union ideology of um, you know this Marxist Leninist ide Leninist ideology uh, believes that the highest political and economic system is um, is communism. Uh, communism is the end state that everybody will eventually reach. So why would they want to be making friends with countries that their ideology tells them is inherently inferior. Um, or um, So he, he articulates that at length, and I think it's a really cool read, and we, we did read that in class. Uh, so here are some other major events in the Cold War. There's slides at length about the Vietnam War, which you'll see in a bit. In 1956, Khrushchev takes power in the Soviet Union after Stalin's death, and Khrushchev tries to begin this process of de-Stalinization. He gives a secret space where he condemns a lot of Stalin's actions. Um, you can see more um, of the 1957 Sputnik launches, uh, which kicks off the space race. Um, of course, the United States sort of kind of wins the space race. Um, in 1969, they put a man on the moon. In 1961, the Berlin Wall is built. Obviously, there's a hyperlink there. There's a cool video on the construction of the Berlin Wall. There's a lot of cool Vox videos. Please watch them in the description. They're part of your review. In 1962, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis takes place. Uh, which is in keeping with this idea that the Cold War in the 1960s was really, really kind of hot. So Nikita Khrushchev uh, wants to put missiles in Cuba. Um, he puts missiles in Cuba, and he would have got it in away with it if it weren't for a U.S. spy uh, plane that actually took a photograph of those images. Um, and then um, Kennedy, um, against his military advisors uh, who want to launch a full-scale invasion of Cuba, he's against them. Because actually, ironically, he read The Guns of August, or not ironically, but he read The Guns of August, um, and we also read excerpts from The Guns of August, so uh, tell me why you think he was against um, his military advisors there. Uh, but he launches a quarantine of the island, which is basically a blockade, and it's often viewed as the closest the United States, uh, or I'm sorry, the world has come to nuclear war. In the 1960s, mutually assured destruction is all the rave, so mutually assured destruction is this idea that the no one's actually actually going to uh, start a nuclear war because you know that if you start it, you can't guarantee that you'll take out that country's nuclear weapons and they'll probably destroy you too. So you're in a system where there's mutually assured destruction. So does that mean um, there's more stability in that system? There's questions about that. Um, that's all the rave. Um, 1968, the Prague Spring takes place. We saw these beautiful images of the Prague Spring and um, we talked about uprisings and reform efforts in Eastern Europe against uh, the communist states in Eastern Europe. Um, so in Czechoslovakia, <coughs> etc. Um, you know, it almost kind of is surmised um, really well by this metaphor that um, communism only seems to be um, enforceable by a gun. Um, you know, Soviet tanks enter Prague and Czechoslovakia. Um, to uh, basically maintain the system, uh, keep it working. And so does this have implications for the fall of communism? Um, probably, yeah. Uh, 1979 to 1989, there's a Soviet war in Afghanistan. Um, we talked about this as um, being not necessarily a primary cause or a cause really at all, but maybe a symbol of uh, eventual, the eventual Soviet um, decline and, and, and a... Um, foreshadowing the Soviet breakup. Um, in 1983, we talked about Reagan's Star Wars project and how Reagan in the 80s really kind of revamps um, the Cold War. This was what is so special about the Cold War, U.S. democratic capitalist ideology, and put the political system first, roughly, and then the economic system, uh, and then the uh, explain how it's an ideology versus the U.S. authoritarian Marxist ideology. Um, or 
authoritarian communist ideology, however you want to have it. Uh, nuclear weapons really made the Cold War unique. Um, bipolarity. And then proxy wars, which are basically... Um, uh, so proxy wars occur when a major power instigates or plays a major role in supporting and directing a party to a conflict, but does only a small portion of the actual fighting itself. Um, so this is actually a common feature of the Cold War. Um, so we talked a lot about these proxy wars um, and uh, interventions, Cold War interventions. Uh, so I'm going to talk about that right now. I talked about West's Cold War, uh, global Cold War at length. Um, here I just, this is from an old YouTube video where I actually um, diagram, um, you know, his argument, uh, ignore ideology. I think that's a pretty bad definition. I, we came up with a better one on action-oriented belief system, but an intervention is any concerted or state-led effort to influence the political direction of another country. Interventions obviously happen a lot in the Cold War. Knowledge about the Vietnam War and its um, interesting relationship, although it's just one intervention of many American interventions in the Cold War is just really, really important. Um, we actually, so I would go through this and then look at the YouTube videos that I included in the links. And then we read excerpts from The Sympathizer. So the book wrestles with a lot of vexing political ideas. The fact that Japan was colonized by France and then eventually is turned over to the Japanese during World War II. Um, and then the French go back and wanting to reassert it, their authority over it, but there's revolutionaries that don't want that. Um, and then being basically divided up into North and South um, in the United States trying to prevent um, South Vietnam from turning communist at virtually all costs. And eventually um, this, this war that results in um, South Vietnam getting take over, taken over by the North in 1975. Um, so he wrestles with all those complicated ideas. And I think it was pretty obvious in the excerpt that I gave you. Um, and I'll include a link. Uh, in the description. Another intervention of the Cold War that we talked about was the um, U.S. coup or overthrow of the Iranian government. Um, so we learned about it through uh, reading excerpts from Persepolis or Persepoli um, in CCR. So I'm just going to read the preface um, to you out loud and then we'll go over the chronology of the events. Um, this is the preface to the comic book Persepolis. It's just the background. You can read it if you want uh, for what uh, the U.S. intervention in Iran in 1953. In 1953, um, the United States uh, CIA with British intelligence overthrows the democratically elected Mohammad Mossadegh and, um, because he decided to nationalize uh, British petroleum. Um, so Britain had a uh, petroleum company that was operating the region. He decides to nationalize it. Uh, the U.S. and Britain then install the dictator of, the, of Iran. Um, uh, they install the dictator uh, called the Shah of Iran. Uh, he rules until 19. One of the reasons why I really love this case study of U.S. intervention in Iran um, was that uh, you get it gets at a lot of ideas. So the first idea it gets at is um, Britain's still trying to play this role as uh, this imperialist power that is looking to do um, overthrow um, the democratically elected prime minister because he's planning on nationalizing their oil and this hurts them economically. Uh, the United States, um, just some context, uh, was fearful of Mossadegh's um, what they interpreted as more communist or socialist leanings. Um, but this case study also gets at what is called blowback. So blowback comes in the form of um, Iran eventually, uh, the Iranian people eventually overthrowing the Shah of Iran. Um, what is interesting about this case study too is there were a lot of left-leaning groups, a lot of communists um, that were uh, very angry at the United States, very angry at the Shah, uh, very non-religious people, um, young people that um, were planning on overthrowing the Shah of Iran, various different groups. But for various reasons, um, they get crowded out by Islamist fundamentalists. Um, so this case study also shows um, that it doesn't necessarily, uh, the blowback, which is the eventual overthrow of the Shah of Iran, who's this incredibly repressive dictator, uh, doesn't necessarily mean uh, that people will naturally adopt, um, you know, communism, right? Um, people in the third world, uh, people in Iran still have agency. Um, and Islamism comes on the scene and becomes a very powerful force in the Middle East 
um, pretty much ever since the Iranian Revolution in 1979, which is 40 years old. So the um, Iranian Revolution leads to establishment of an Islamic Republic. Um, so fundamentalist, um, fundamentalist um, interpretations of Islam uh, prevail. Fundamentalism is basically um, strict or literal adherence to a set of basic principles. Um, so Islam, Islamism becomes a major uh, political ideology in the Middle East and um, has influenced uh, to this day. Islamism is the belief that Islam should influence political systems. Um, a theocracy is established in Iran. A theocracy is where the religious leadership is in charge. Um, and we see this on display in Percy Pauline. Um, obviously, um, Mahjong, um, the young girl in the book is, or in the comic book, is not very happy with the establishment of an Islamic Republic. I uploaded the complete comic book for you guys on Google Classroom, but here's just uh, the first slide. Um, also, it gets at how the Cold War, um, this case study gets at how the Cold War has still has impact to this day. So obviously, um, everyone is well aware of the recent uh, developments where the U.S., there was talk about the United States and Iran going to war after President Trump um, uh, killed uh, Soleimani, a top um, Iranian general. Um, but tensions with Iran have pretty much been um, strained um, ever since the Iranian Revolution. After the Iranian Revolution, um, Iranian um, students uh, likely encouraged um, by um, the regime uh, stormed the American embassy and take 53 people hostage. Anti-Americanism is very rampant in Iran today. Uh, you also find that anti-Americanism is very rampant in North Korea today, uh, which is also a relic of the Cold War. So go ahead and see um, the links in the bio. Please watch the links in the bio or the description. AP World History is complicated. There really is no easy division between good and bad guys. Um, but one of the big takeaways about American conduct in the Cold War is the United States did some really um, heinous and illiberal stuff, um, 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 kind of reprehensible stuff in the name of uh, national security or uh, the fight against uh, communism. Um, so I think, you know, that's, that's pretty um, obvious. And I think um, we'll talk a little bit more about Soviet interventions in the next section. Um, but I want you to keep away with that takeaway um, and be able to critically evaluate uh, the United States uh, United States conduct in foreign policy um, to this very day. Uh, because obviously anti-Americanism in Iran and North Korea, for example, has a history. Um, and um, there's an explanations for so many of the things that you see in world politics today that is rooted especially in the Cold War. So the war in Afghanistan is a major Soviet intervention in Afghanistan. Those are the details there. Uh, the Soviets lose in 1989. It's not a major cause of the Soviet collapse and then um, therefore the collapse or the end of the Cold War. Um, but it is very symbolic. Uh, the United States helps fund the Mujahideen um, in Afghanistan. And we talked about this in class. Um, so now we're going to get into like reasons why the Soviet Union collapsed and then the Cold War fell. Um, and then let me explain that we're going to go back in time. We're going to talk about how China becomes communist. And then we're going to also talk about um, responses to, um, um, or I'm sorry, uh, global resistance and decolonization as well. And so Gorbachev is one of the principal causes of the collapse of the, Cold, or the Soviet Union. So he comes to power in 1985. He institutes perestroika and glasnost, um, which are attempts to reform the so Soviet system, and they basically lead into like a, uh, a domino effect, and the whole system collapses. The a simple version of the history is once people start uh, tasting uh, these reforms and tasting what they view as greater political and economic freedom, they want more. Um, gradually, um, the whole Soviet system collapses in Eastern Europe after uh, Gorbachev. Um, rescinds the commitment to intervene in um, Eastern Europe, which is actually very prevalent in the 1960s, which we'll see in the global responses, or global resistance to state power section, uh, which is going back in time 
Why did Gorbachev want to do this? Um, well, there are a variety of economic challenges um, from running a state-run economy, um, military factors, including the country was just spending tons of money on defense spending. Reagan ramps up the defense budget in the United States and they outcompete the Soviet Union. Uh, political and ideological factors, um, again, Gorbachev. Um, and there's just a variety of different um, nationalist sentiments in um, parts of the Soviet Union. And so the, the Soviet Union just unravels and um, falls apart. And then um, the end of the Cold War takes place. So the Soviet satellite states start looking for greater uh, freedom in the 1990s, um, start reforming and becoming uh, more democratic. Um, the Soviet Union breaks apart. Um, so Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, Georgia, Ukraine, etc., Belarus, they leave, uh, they become independent. Um, Russia uh, becomes a democracy. Um, and it sounds like a happy ending, um, but of course um, it's never that simple. And uh, basically what happens is that a lot of these countries kind of really suck at democracy and capitalism. And for various reasons, um, they slide back into authoritarianism. At least that's the case with Russia. So we're going to talk about that at length in Unit 9. So this is a picture of Mao Zedong. He eventually comes into power and uh, rules uh, communist China. Before that, let's just get a little bit of background. Uh, so Japan, after the Meiji Restoration in the 1870s, remember they industrialized and they successfully industrialized, they begin a period of expanding. They expand significantly in uh, parts of China and Korea uh, for several years. Um, so they actually, Japan actually fights a war with Russia, and Russia is uh, actually very, very fearful of Japan. Um, the first Russo-Japanese War, they, they fight in 1905. Um, so... After the um, Russian Revolution and Russia goes communist, um, they um, use this organization called Com Intern, Com International, to c cultivate and develop uh, communists around the world. Um, they're looking to cultivate and develop communists in China. Uh, Mao Zedong um, becomes communist thanks to Com Intern. Um, eventually, um, as the Japanese start uh, in, in uh, uh, invading uh, China more fully in the 19 in 1931 and 1937, there's the race of Nanking, where the Japanese uh, brutally, um, you know, kill tons of civilians and, and rape civilians as well. Um, um, so the, the the Nationalist Chinese Party um, eventually, um, they although they do. Uh, uh, have fights with the Communist Party and um, Chiang Kai-shek, who's the leader of the Nationalist Party, does try to exterminate the Communists. Eventually, of course, um, the Japanese threat goes away. Uh, the civil war in China resumes and um, Mao Zedong comes on top for various reasons. I'll include a very cool article, um, uh, an op-ed from um, McFarkar, uh, who's this expert on Chinese uh, politics at Harvard University. Uh, that's really cool. And then, of course, a Vox video as well to explain. Uh, Mao Zedong comes to power. Um, he is this um, charismatic figure. Um, he's in power for roughly... Mao Zedong is in power from 1949 when the Chinese Communist... or the People's Republic of China, uh, ruled by the Chinese Communist Party, is established in 1949 until 1976, until his death. Um, he um, His two signature proposals while he's in power, the first is the Great Leap Forward, um, so he tries to industrialize and modernize China fast. It's a catastrophe. Millions of people die in famine. Um, there's the collectivization of agriculture. And then there's actually p uh, people physically building or trying to, um, um, you know, convert, I guess, melt steel or make steel with like makeshift furnaces that are just not working. It's an economic catastrophe. It's a huge catastrophe. Millions of people die. Um, and then in the 1960s, 1966 specifically, up until really um, his, his death, he starts the Cultural Revolution. The Cultural Revolution is basically he uh, forms para, or he inspires paramilitary, paramilitary young people uh, to go out and purge um, unpure elements of society. 
or I should say backwards elements of Chinese society. So they tried to erase uh, basically old Chinese culture, ancient Chinese culture. They debase statues. They um, target even government officials that are not viewed as um, as fervently uh, Maoist as these people like. Um, there's this great Vox video that I've included. Please, please watch the Vox video because this is very uh, complicated. So now we're going to switch gears and talk about decolonization. Um, so after World War II, uh, decolonization takes place um, on a rapid scale in the 50s and 60s. Um, uh, imperial powers are basically weak and hobbled. Uh, they grant independence. We're going to look at two case studies um, in Israel, um, Palestine, and of course, or not of course, but in India and in Pakistan. We'll look at those case studies of decolonization and see how they went. So in India and Pakistan, um, the, this is one method of decolonization. Gandhi um, obviously is this adherent of uh, passive uh, resistance of civil disobedience, and um, he kind of uh, gets um, the Hindus and Muslims to agree and to recognize the common enemy, which is British imperialists. For a while, Britain had practiced the um, strategy of divide and rule and had pitted Hindus and Muslims against each other. Um, Actually, when India leaves, um, this um, strategy of rule actually has an impact because then um, after Britain eventually divides the country into three pieces, really, Pakistan, India, and then parts of modern-day Bangladesh, um, Hindus and Muslims have it out. Please, please watch the Vox video on this. It's very, very good, and it explains all of the nuances that you need to know um, for the AP test. So the Algerian case study doesn't uh, starts off bloody. Um, the Indian case study ends bloody, right? But they, in Algeria, um, the Algerian indigenous people basically fight using guerrilla tactics and even terrorist tactics. Um, and you can see the definition of guerrilla uh, tactics and terrorism there. Um, they fight uh, for independence. Uh, they fight against uh, French colonial rule. Um, we talked about the horrors of uh, the French imperial system at length. Um, France basically develops this apartheid state, meaning a separate state between, uh, or, or separates indigenous people from uh, Europeans. It's, um, it's, it's a horrible way to live. Um, Alger indigenous Algerians fight back and they achieve independence that way. Also talked about the Arab-Israeli conflict, um, how that basically is this crisis of decolonization again. Uh, so please go back and look at that. I'll include videos on the Suez crisis as well. Uh, but look at the Arab-Israeli conflicts. They're so, so, so complicated and drawn out. Um, there's a, going to be a Vox video on that one again. Please use the videos in the description. They're going to help you out and learn this uh, material that is super, super complicated. Please, please, please. Bye.